Once upon a time in New York, there lived a genius named Jane. She was an activist, an author, and an observer. She particularly observed life in Greenwich Village, where she lived, and she soon realized that the urban renewal projects she was writing about for various magazines were destroying wonderful neighborhoods like the one where she lived, replacing them with non-places. She called the process urban removal. So she wrote a great book about what made her neighborhood a good place to live. President Obama called it the great book on cities. In Death and Life, Jane asked, what's the first thing you see when you visit a city? And her answer was, streets and their sidewalks, the main public spaces of a city are its most vital organs. Think of a city and what comes to mind, its streets. If a city's streets look interesting, the city looks interesting. If they look dull, the city looks dull. So what do we see today when we walk around Penn Station? This view shows what the star architect Rem Koolhaas calls junk space. It came after urban removal took away the buildings that enclosed the street, and the streets turned into machine space, a space for moving cars and trucks, not a place for humans to live city life. But streets are about more than transportation, especially when they're right next to a great train station in a great city where most of the residents don't own cars. A lot of city life takes place in public spaces. Here in New York, we don't have as many squares and plazas as European cities have. Three quarters of the public space in New York is in our streets, the, sp the space between the buildings. And before King Car took over and what's good for General Motors became good for America, we used our streets very differently. This is a view of Fifth Avenue next to Madison Square when a temporary arch celebrated Admiral Dewey. Here's a view of Broadway at Herald Square in 1908, looking north towards Times Square. The low building on the right is the New York Herald Building, another building designed by Kim Beaton White that's lost to history. When we zoom in, you can see that most of the people are over on the sidewalk, but that there are also people out in the street waiting for the cable car that ran up and down Broadway. And you can see that the people cross the street wherever they wanted, Pedestrians, cable cars, motor cars, and horse-drawn wagons all shared the space. Everyone had to accommodate the slowest and most vulnerable, the pedestrians. One hundred years later, this is the hottest topic in street design, called shared space. No matter how far we zoom in, you won't see any stoplights, stop signs, or crosswalks. In fact, you won't see any traffic signs or any paint marking travel lanes or parking spaces for cars because none of those things had been invented yet. Now, cities like London and Paris are going back to the future and sometimes removing all the traffic engineering detritus. That was in 1909. The Model T Ford went into production a year before in 1908, and the world rapidly changed. The coalition of car companies and oil companies that called themselves Organized Motordom realized that if they wanted to sell lots of cars, they had to claim the streets for the free flow of traffic. In 1908, the sidewalks on Fifth Avenue were wider than the roadbed. In 1909, the city reversed that proportion, giving more space to the cars to make what the New York Times called New York's greatest driveway. They kicked the pedestrians to the side of the road, added stoplights, and made it illegal for people on foot to cross the road anywhere but at the corner and it only got worse after that. Jane Jacobs looked at road widenings like this one on Lexington Avenue and saw other ways that we were making the streets worse for people. This shows what she called a border vacuum, which is bad for city streets. I'll explain. It's actually easy to make a street what people want to be. It has to be safe, interesting, and comfortable, with things to do and places to go. Comfortable usually means that it feels enclosed, with the space between the buildings not being too large. Interesting means that beauty is good and ugly is bad. We know for a fact that people walking go out of their way to avoid ugliness. The buildings shaping the street don't have to be low. New York has great streets with wonderful tall buildings. Broad Street is one of the best public spaces in America. Here's a mid-block view of what Bornado calls the Penn Station campus. 
This is not one of the great public spaces in America. It's a place that people avoid if they can, and it even kills pedestrian life on the other side of the street. It's partly a product of New York City's 1961 zoning resolution. Tall glass towers became more important than making a comfortable street. For street geeks like me, it's interesting that the zoning resolution came out the same year that Jacobs published Death of Life. The two are night and day. The street feels wide and dangerous with speeding traffic. Public space is eroded. The mid-block entrance to Penn Station and Madison Square Garden feels like a dark and ugly hole. No one wants to walk here, but this is the introduction to New York City for many who arrive by train. What about the surrounding streets? This view of 6th Avenue and Midtown shows how the New York State Economic Development Corporation want to fix what they call the blight around Penn Station but Penn Station is the blight. Jane wrote way back in Death and Life that these glass boxes are boring and that they make boring streets, and she was right. And here's the most quoted line in urban design. We shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. That line from Winston Churchill is repeated so often because it's true. Neuroscientists, psychologists, and sociologists confirm that architecture affects our happiness and well-being. 8th Avenue and 34th Street are the same width as 2nd Avenue and 86th Street, where this photo was taken. Right now, they're all what we call auto sewers. And most of the time, the traffic doesn't even flow well, which is their whole reason for being. Cities and the buildings and streets and squares that make them are among the greatest achievements of humanity. We want to pass them on to our descendants. We don't want to pass on inhumanly scaled, climate-killing cities that make the world worse now and in the future. There are many ways to make New York City streets safer, less noisy, less polluted, and better for city life. Here's another one of those ways. There's a revolution going on. We are starting to use our streets differently. This, of course, is a photo of Fifth Avenue next to Madison Square, the same place that had the arch in the middle of the street a century ago. But the evolution of the revolution is slow. The street is incrementally better than the streets we were building 20 years ago, but it's still a street for moving cars in and out of the city. If we had more time, I could explain how this is really a suburban-style transportation corridor in the middle of the city. It says to suburbanites, come on in, bring your car, our streets are just like yours. By the way, if you want to know what bad feng shui feels like, just stand at an intersection on a New York City street when the traffic light changes. But time is up. So if you're interested in learning more about what Jane Jacobs said and did, there's lots more in The Death and Life of Great American Cities and in books about Jane, like Roberta Gratz's The Battle for Gotham. As an activist, Jane Jacobs was the first private citizen to stop Robert Moses. And she was a preservationist who made the Greenwich Village Historic District a model for what the historic districts should be. There's much to learn from St. Jane, the patron saint of CNUNYC. Thank you.